Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure to welcome you to the afternoon session and to our first invited lecture. And it is quite a useless job I have to do now. I need to introduce somebody who everybody knows. So, um, but what can I tell you about Henrik, Professor Henrik Lund that you maybe doesn't know at all? What I learned yesterday evening is that Henrik is member of many societies of many boards, but he is not member of uh, social networks. So he's not a member of Facebook, for example. But uh, nevertheless, when you look in internet for Henrik, you find quite a lot of information. <laughs> and when I finish uh, reading your CV here, I think you have five minutes left uh, to talk your presentation. When I read all these things Henrik was doing during his life, I tried to imagine a typical day of his life. And I think he needs to wake up very early. And after having a short and quick coffee, I think all the day he is reading. He is reading scientific articles. He is a member or reviewer. Uh, editor-in-chief, guest editor, and a lot of other roles in not less than 17 scientific journals. And I think when he's doing that all the day, reading articles, then in the evening he is meeting uh, with advisory boards and having good dinners. So I found that he is uh, advising many governmental and non-governmental boards for example, in Qatar, of course in Denmark, also here in Croatia, in Norway, and also in Luxembourg. And what I also know, he still has time to care about his family and his two daughters. And I think now we can come back uh, to the beginning. He has a big advantage, according to the average young PhD student, by not being a member of Facebook, he saves at the average two hours per day that he can then spend uh, with his family. So now, Henrik, we are looking forward to your presentation about smart energy systems, the design of 100% renewable energy solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both for the invitation to come here, but also for the very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, what I'm going to address here, the smart uh, energy system, is very much uh, a follow-up, you can say, on uh, something we have been debating on the many previous conferences here in uh, Dubrovnik from the very beginning. I mean, the whole idea of the, uh, the, the conferences here are to think cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral between the sectors and identify the best and the good solutions uh, when you're not looking only into parts of it, but when you take everything into consideration. And this is also very much what I'm going to address today in the smart energy systems. But also from the very beginning, we have been uh, uh, allowing ourselves to, uh, to address the 100% solution, not only increasing, not only building some renewable energy, but also looking to the vision of the 100% solution. And that's also what I, what I will base uh, and go further on uh, uh, today. So uh, we have had many presentations throughout the many conferences on the 100% renewable energy, and this is what I also will add what uh, is new, I think, within this uh, line of business. A lot of what uh, I will talk about here is also mentioned in a book that I just published the second edition of last year. And I spread out some, uh, some PR material around the chairs and there's also something out there. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the book, please uh, consider to do so. In the new uh, second edition, there is a chapter that I wrote together with uh, the research group uh, participating in the writing of this, where we have focused on the smart part of it. We call it smart energy systems and also smart infrastructures. And uh, what I will talk about here today is, uh, is a lot about what is written there and how we can do better by thinking cross-sectoral. Coming from Denmark, I always show this one because uh, not when we started the, uh, the Dubrovnik conferences in 2002 and onwards, 
But later on, the Danish government decided to have a 100% renewable energy target and goal, and this is actually what we still have now. I think it's the fourth government that have now confirmed that this is our long-term target for year 2050, to go to 100% renewable energy. This is, of course, uh, following up on the discussion we had uh, in the panel this morning. This is something that the politicians dare to decide because scientists and industry and so on have claimed that this is actually something we can do. And this is something we have been debating here and claimed in, in these conferences and, and elsewhere. But also, of course, when we declare as researchers and industry, this is something we can do and the politician then decide this is what we should do, then of course we also raise the question 100% renewable energy 2050 in Denmark and in other countries, uh, but how, how should we do it? And uh, what I would promote here is the concept of uh, smart energy systems. And uh, the whole idea of this concept is that when we should do this and when we should uh, identify how to do it and do it in the best way, the least cost way, the most liable uh, way, then it's urgent, then it's essential that we think between the sectors and we cross between the sectors. And I always make a little fool of, even though it's risky, I always make a little fool of the smart grid concept. Uh, not that I uh, think we should not have smart grid, not that I think we should have dumb grids or unsmart grid or anything like that, but because when I see how a smart grid is talked about and also how it's exercised, then there is the problem that it's very sector oriented only to the electricity only sector. And um, as I will try to document here, this leads to some mistakes, or at least it seems to lead to mistakes. Because if you take a sole electricity view, then you'll very often start with that we have this demand that go up in the day and down in the night, and then we have the wind and the PV and the wave and the tidal and so on, and there is a mismatch, and what should we do about it? And very often you come to three things you can do about it. The one is flexible demand, so we can turn on our refrigerator and, and, and switch it on and off uh, according to how the wind blows, things like that. Or uh, we could do electricity storage, uh, or we could maybe build some more transmission line to our neighboring countries. And I, what I will uh, claim here today is these three measures are exactly the, the measures that will not do the job. These three measures cannot really integrate wind into the European or the Danish or the Croatian uh, system. We need uh, other measures uh, to do that. And if we try to do it with these measures, it will also become extremely expensive. So uh, what we should do is to think uh, between the sectors and ask ourselves, it's not only a matter of electricity. How do we go to 100% renewable in energy in the electricity sector? We also need to ask ourselves, how do we do it in the heating or the cooling or the industry or the transport and so on? And this is what I will try to do today. And when you ask yourself those questions, then you will be able to identify smarter and better and more least cost solution to the integration of renewable energy. That will be my claim today. So if we look upon this between the sexes and look everything together, then we can find better solution. Why is that? Well, there are several reasons for that, but there is one major reason for that that I will highlight here. And I will highlight that by showing this uh, diagram here where we have listed up the cost of different ways of storing energy. And please note it's a logarithmic scale, so it's, there's really a big difference. To the left, there is the cost uh, if we, and this is the investment cost per how much energy you can store in a storage. Uh, to the left, there is the electricity, and then we have the thermal, and then we have the gas, and then we have the liquid fuels. And there are some examples here. Uh, electricity could be pumped hydro, but the price is more or less the same, no matter any kind of a, a technology we will choose here. The thermal is a tank of water that is sometimes hot and sometimes cold. 
And then the gas here is an underground natural gas storage, and the liquid fuel storage is an oil tank, but of course you could also put methanol or something else, a, a green fuel into it. The uh, point making in this diagram here is that storing energy in terms of electricity is in the order of magnitude 100, and I'm not exaggerating, 100 times more expensive than storing thermal heat. And thermal heat is even more expensive than storing gas or, or liquid fuel. And this gives us, uh, tells us one thing, if we can somehow coordinate between the sectors so the hour where we need to store something, we can store it as heat or gas or liquid fuel, then it's much, much, much more realistic that we can actually store a lot of wind and other energy uh, into our systems at a reasonable cost. So we should look for ways of integrating the sector so we can make use of the cheap storage and not the expensive ones. That's one point. That's another point. And this is when we just look into the thermal storage. Then there's uh, also a big difference if it's a small storage. And here I have a 160 liter um, heat storage that many of us, this is actually from, from one of my neighbor's houses. Uh, this is, uh, and I have the same in my own house. Uh, this is a very normal storage you have there. And then you can also, as illustrated here, go to, to the upper right corner, for example, is from Skane District Heating Plant. This is a district heating thermal storage where there is around four cubic meter per, per consumer in this uh, storage there. And you can also go to the recent uh, that is being built now in Denmark, recent uh, storage of uh, seasonal storage of solar thermal. And again, if you measure this per how much do you have to pay in investment per how much you can store? There is again a factor 100. Actually, there is a factor 1,000, but I don't want to exaggerate, so let's just say a factor 100 between if we try to do this in each house compared to if we do it together. So uh, not only should we look for not electricity storage, but we should also look for doing this together. So if we can somehow organize it so that we can store it as thermal heat and doing it together, then it will be much cheaper. It's more or less the same story if we take a look at the electricity storage. Not that I argue we should do that, but, but just for the sake of the argument. Here's also compared individual storage, such as the Tesla battery that is very discussed right now, that is in, uh, in you can put in individual houses and the price of that compared to other electricity storage. It's not a factor. 100 now, it's maybe a factor 10 or something, but still, maybe the most expensive storage of them all is if we try to store the wind in each house in a battery. That is the most expensive of them all. And from there, we can do better by joining up, do it together, and we can do much better by not storing it as electricity. So this is what smart energy systems is about, and this is why it's, it's so urgent to take a holistic uh, view. I'll make a little jump now. I'll jump to uh, power to heat. That is asking myself the question, how should we heat Denmark or Croatia or Europe for that matter in a 100% renewable energy system? How should we heat it? And I'll just start by showing this uh, diagram here that is actually old. It's an old diagram before, from before we really started to build all the wind turbines in Denmark, but, but we had the plans and the discussion. Here you see four different technologies of producing some electricity and some heat. They all produce the same, but they use very different amounts of fuels. If you look to the upper right corner, I call that one the traditional system. That's why it, had to, it used to be the traditional one in Denmark. This is where we have power stations in Denmark. They are thermal power stations and boilers separate from one another. And then we use a lot of fuel to produce electricity and to produce the heat. Then if you go to the, uh, to the lower left, the CHP system, this is where we do combine heat and power, and everybody in this room knows, and this is just illustrated here, then we can save a lot of fuel. So if we can produce the heat and the power at the same uh, place and at the same time and, and still use the, the heat, then we can uh, decrease fuel. But you can also see to the 
upper left corner is if we go to electric heating, we will increase the fuel consumption enormously. It's, uh, anyway, if we are in a, in a system like the Danish with thermal power stations. But what you can also see is that uh, if we look into the future and maybe we don't want to have so much uh, CHP and fossil fuels in, in the power stations, then we could add some wind turbines and we can still decrease the fuel and do it in an efficient way if we add, uh, as illustrated here, a heat pump and then we can also add heat storage and so on and so forth. And this is actually the situation we are in in Denmark right now. We are in the situation in which we have benefited a lot from going from the traditional system to the CHP system. In the next slide, I will show how much we have benefited from that. But right now, we are building so much and so many wind turbines that we are slightly decreasing the fossil fuel production and the CHP. And for that reason, we'll go going into this system here and need to identify uh, how to integrate the wind into the, the heating system as well. This is just to illustrate how much we have gained from this in the Danish system. If you look at the upper curve, this is uh, how much the blue one is, how much heated area we have from the oil crisis in 72 and until approximately now or 10 years ago, but it's still more or less the same, it's still increasing. So, um, so we increased the number of square meters we heat, but because we are being good to insulate the houses, the energy we need directly into the house in terms of oil or gas or district heating, have been decreased. At the same time, as illustrated down here, we've been able to go uh, from a lot of boilers into more and more district heating, by gradually by expanding the district heating, but also by replacing boilers with CHP, both in the central cities and also in the small, smaller towns and villages. We have actually done that to an extent, so today, more than half of our heat is produced in combined heat and production and also more than half of our electricity is produced in, in uh, combined heat and power production. So we save a lot of fuel from that. And if we take a look of how much fuel uh, we save, it's illustrated here how we've been able from the 72 and until now to decrease the fuel we spend on heating our houses uh, in Denmark, and this is a combination of insulating the houses and also having this CHP and district heating, and also how we've been able to replace a lot of oil with renewable energy and gas and, 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 and still some oil and coal also. So uh, this is the benefit of that. But we now have a ch challenge uh, in Denmark, and that is what about the future when we will have less and less fossil fuels and more and more wind, should we then uh, still keep on having the district heating or what should we do? And this is something we investigate in the 48th uh, research project that has also been mentioned already this uh, morning where we sort of look into the future. It's called 48th because we think it's uh, the next generation will be the fourth generation of district heating. We believe we have already had three generations. And if you look at the generations, there are one, two, three, four, then it's illustrated how into the future we think that uh, yes, there will be less CHP, but there will be a lot of other things. First of all, in the future, the houses will be lower energy uh, demands, or, uh, uh, and as you can illustrate up here, they'll be more efficient, and, but also for that reason, we need to decrease the temperatures in the district heating grid not to have too many losses. But while we do that, that we'll also benefit because then on the production side, we can easily integrate heat pumps, we can use more waste heat from industry, and also we believe that in the future there will be a lot of biomass conversion in order to deal with the transport sector. I'll come back to that in a moment. And that will also sweat off some waste heat that we can use in the district uh, heating uh, sector. So this is how we believe that the future uh, will, will look. And we have a motto in the, this research project. We say district heating is here to stay, but district heating has to change. We believe that uh, when we, and I'll come back to that soon, when we design a 100% renewable energy, we can do it better and with less pressure on the wind turbines and the biomass if we include district heating compared to if we do not. Uh, and, um, and, and for that reason, we believe district heating is here to stay, but the future will be different. There will not be so much CHP and there will be more wind and there will not be 
so much uh, heat demands in each house. So for that reason, also the district heating uh, technology will help to develop. In some scenarios, when we ask ourselves how should we heat the houses, you can uh, see that uh, at least I have seen some scenarios looking into the future in which uh, it's sort of claimed that uh, the lifetime of a building is only 30 years or something like that. And if we look in 40 years into the future, then we can replace all the buildings. And then they can all be zero energy buildings or, or even plus energy houses. And then the heating of houses is not an issue any longer. I don't believe that. Uh, especially not when I take a walk in lovely Dubrovnik or Lausanne or Edinburgh or Paris or any city in Europe. Uh, you can see the houses. It's much older than 40 years, and, and it's very difficult to make them all into zero energy. But still, I do believe that we should save. And we had a research project in, in Denmark called Zero Energy Buildings, in which we tried to identify how much should we save, how much should we uh, insulate the houses, and what and how should we then produce the rest of the heat that we need. And uh, the conclusion we reached was that uh, we should save. We should actually have be ambitious on the energy savings. Maybe we should be as ambitious as saying that we will decrease the per unit consumption in average of all houses in Denmark or Europe for that matter to 50% to of what it is today. But still there will be a lot of hot water and a lot of space heating left. And then what should we do then? Uh, how should we heat that? And when you look at the whole system, then the conclusion we have reached is that if we are in an urban area, if we are in a smart city area, then district heating is by far the best you can do if you cannot allow yourself to burn fossil fuels. And, and in those district heating, as you just mentioned, in the future there will be heat pumps, power, power to heat. Outside the urban areas, we believe that, uh, that it should be... Uh, also individual heat pumps. That is what will match best uh, with the system. Uh, again, along with uh, savings. We have also calculated this for Europe in the heat roadmap Europe studies that uh, already have been mentioned here and uh, sort of uh, asking ourselves what will be the best way of heating Europe. Sort of coming to the same conclusion that in the urban areas we should have district heating outside the urban areas we should have um, heat pumps. And we have sort of calculated that if we do that, then we will be able to uh, decrease the cost uh, of heating in Europe at the same time as we do good for the environment and we can really, really save a lot of import of gas to all the boilers and oil to all the boilers. Let me just mention one figure. And one figure is that the, the waste heat from electricity production in Europe alone exceeds our total heat demands of all the building of all of Europe. So if we can somehow organize to get that waste heat to the building, of course we cannot organize that every basis at every hour, but we can maybe organize it for half of it in a, in a feasible way, then we can actually save a lot, a lot of gas and a lot of oil. As already mentioned, this has now been uh, dealt with in the strategic project in which uh, we look into different countries, among others, uh, so, sorry, not different, but five different countries, these different countries here. And uh, there we also try to investigate, and there will be presentations uh, by my colleagues later on on the conference here on how it looks on the individual country level. Um, let me just mention one figure more, and that is if we take, because very often it's said that it's only in Denmark you need to heat your houses, and uh, district heating is only relevant to the north and not to the south. But if you take a country like Italy, and in Italy they actually have a lot of district heating, in Italy the heating demand currently, as it is just now, is, uh, is uh, way uh, more than the cooling demand. The cooling demand is only 15% of the current heating demand. Then of course it can develop. But just uh, to give the impression that also in Italy uh, we need to cover some heating demands. So the conclusion of this is that as far as I see the future, uh, and if we want to get rid of all fossil fuels in the heating, and we ask ourselves how could we best do that, 
than district heating and heat pumps, and also heat pumps in the district heating. That is power to heat, that is efficient way of turning wind turbines and PVE power into to heating. Uh, this is something that will be an, uh, one of the key technologies that we will have to, uh, and, or we should uh, include. And this is power to heat. So my question here is, if we realize that for the sake of the heating, not for the sake of the wind turbines or the PV and so on, then we might as well ask ourselves, why not save uh, the wind energy when it's heat instead of save it, it when it's electricity? Because then it becomes much, much cheaper. And if we save it in district heating system, then it becomes even cheaper compared to just, uh, save it in individual houses. So that's one point. Now I'll turn a little bit to looking at the overall uh, system. How, if we want to include everything, not only the heating and the electricity, and now we'll come back to the transport, then how could we do that in a 100% uh, renewable energy? And I'll just uh, take my part of, point of departure in uh, an energy plan that I actually presented here in this conference some years ago, and it's also old, it's from 2006, it had been repeated in 2009, and we are actually now repeating it again. But it's an energy plan made by the Danish Association of Engineers. And when we made it in 2006, the whole idea was to give a wake-up call to the politicians, because at that time we did not have this uh, wonderful target we have now of 100% renewable energy. It came out of the discussions from then. But here we sort of looked at uh, what are the perspectives of uh, going into a 100% renewable uh, solution and also what are the business potentials. In Denmark we have very good experience with the wind turbines and a lot of other technologies that we can, that we can uh, uh, develop while we're doing all this. Uh, but also part of this uh, plan was a 100% renewable energy uh, draft. How could we do it? And um, we came sort of to the conclusion that it's, it's doable. Uh, but there are, some, uh, there are some challenges in it, of course. It's doable from the perspective that, yes, we can build enough wind turbines in Denmark, and we can also, so we can do this in a combination of wind turbines and uh, and, um, and biomass, and of course, we could also add PV and other things uh, to this. <laughs> but it's doable, uh, from a, uh, and we do need to do some savings and so on. But there are some big challenges, and we lined out uh, two uh, challenges uh, when we looked in this uh, perspective here. The one is uh, the biomass. And uh, how much biomass can we allow ourselves? How much biomass is sustainable biomass? And um, in 2006, this was something being debated, and it's of course still is. Uh, but at that time, uh, there were really many, many uh, views uh, on this. We asked some of the agricultural people, and some of them say, well, a country like Denmark can just shift all the crops we grew on the fields, and we can uh, grow plenty of also energy crops and also feed ourselves. <laughs> but we also have environmental life cycle assessment people who say, no, 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 we cannot do that. If we do that, it will change the whole market and it will change the pressure on, on wet areas in Malaysia and, and Canada and other places. So that would be a disaster. So that was one of the discussion. Uh, and other point was what to do about transportation. And in uh, this uh, draft we made in 2006, we, um, we looked upon this and uh, we could see it's not, it's not a sole solution. It's not like we can say electric cars and everybody is, is solved. We have to do a more close analysis of that. But at least we made a draft. Then afterwards, <coughs> ending in 2011, 2012, um, we headed a project with the participation of almost all universities in Denmark called the CESA, Korean and Energy and Environmental System Analysis, very much aligned with the, uh, with the view of this conference here to, uh, to combine environmental and energy system analysis and we sort of took a closer look at some of the things that uh, was a real challenge. So we took a closer look at the biomass issue and also at the transportation issue. So we looked very much into the transport uh, sector and divided it into how long do we drive in a car and how many drives and so on. 
And also, we, as we always do, include the aircraft, because that's a real challenge, and the heavy duty, and the ships, and so on and so forth. Uh, and when we sort of concluded on all this, then we could see that if we go to the transport sector and try to identify, and we try to identify how we can do it with the technologies we more or less have, what technologies would we really wish for, and what would be likely in between there. But of course, the conclusion um, is that we should do as much electric vehicle as possible. This is the, really the chance of, of doing this in an efficient uh, way, but we cannot do all transportation needs by electric vehicles. So somehow we need to produce some gas, methane or something, or some green fuels, methanol or something that we should add to all this. But we could also soon uh, see if we combine that with the other issue, the issue of biomass, how much biomass would we have in a sustainable way in Denmark, what are our residual resources also when we take into consideration that the rest of the world should have, have a similar share of, of resources. Then we could easily see that producing, for example, this fuel we are lagging on rapeseed or something, we have to forget about it. Denmark is simply not big enough. Even if we produce rapeseed in, in the whole of Denmark, we cannot do this. So, um, so we had to do, do it smarter, do it in another way. And when we asked ourselves, and this project, we have both the agricultural people and, and the life cycle people and so on included, when we asked ourselves how to do this, then the solution we came up with was hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is when we take some of the, uh, uh, the winds or the PV or whatever and by electrolysis turns it into hydrogen. But don't use it as hydrogen, but take this hydrogen and add it to some of the carbon that we have from the biomass, thermal gasification, biogas and so on, and then boost it. And then we can boost it so much that we can uh, cover the needs uh, we, uh, we think. And this leads us to the next point that is sort of power to transportation. And my colleagues will have more details on this in the, in the presentations in, in, the, in the coming days. Uh, but uh, when our conclusion here is that somehow we need to take some of the wind, produce hydrogen, add this hydrogen to some carbon, end up with some methane or methanol or similar, and then we can make uh, all this work. So the point is, for that reason, we need to do some power to transport, that is some power to gas or power to liquid fuel. And of course, there are losses on this. Whenever we uh, introduce an electrolyzer or uh, any kind of conversion in which we end up with methane and methanol, then there will be some losses. We say that we should take on those losses not because of the wind turbines or the PVs or whatever, but because of the transportation, because this is the way we can see that we can actually make the numbers fit and also do the transportation in a sustainable way in a 100% renewable energy system. So we take on the losses in order to do the transportation. Uh, and then when we do that, of course, we investigated uh, different ways of, of uh, doing this, and I will not go into detail with these different diagrams here, but uh, coming from electricity to the left to somehow something, it's easy in the beginning because it's some trains or some cars that can go on electricity. It becomes more complicated when you try to do a methane or methanol and you want to include some straws or some gasification and hydrogenation as illustrated here, and there are uh, more ways uh, of doing it. But the point here is, and that's the important point about it is, that for the sake of transportation, we realize that we'll have to do some power to gas, power to liquid fuel, and then we can ask ourselves, if uh, this is uh, what we'll have to do because of the transportation, then why not store the energy when we have turned it into gas or liquid fuel rather than when it's electricity. 
And again, here we get an enormous benefit out of that because then we can store it much, much cheaper, as I already mentioned here in the beginning. And this is sort of what smart energy systems uh, are all about. This is identifying the solution here by taking all the different corners of the energy system into uh, consideration. Uh, and this is where you realize that we have to have power to heat and power to gas and power to transport and so on. And then we also sort of for free get the option of uh, storing it, uh, the wind, much cheaper. And when you look at, uh, at wind front, then very often it blows for a week and then it's, there's no wind for a week or something like that. Meaning that, it's, uh, that it, you had to have rather huge amount of energy stored and you cannot fill and empty those storage very often, which makes it a very hard investment to, uh, to make feasible. And that's why we need uh, cheap storage options. I will uh, just by the end here say something about definitions because I think that's, that's an interesting thing. So I've been talking here about smart energy systems and smart grid, but how should we define it? When I wrote that chapter in the book, I took a look into smart grid. What is it? Because we all talk about it and have been talking about it for a long time. But what is, is the definition and where does it come from? As far as I could see, it's written for this paper here from 2005, uh, written by some electrical engineers. And they sort of more discuss. In the old days, we did not have the computer. Now we have the computer, but we still uh, operate the electric system as if we do not have invented a computer. We can do this much smarter in the distribution grid, in the demands, in the production, and so on. So that's what they call a smart grid, but they never make a scientific definition of it. So I was looking for definitions, and the first definitions I could find is definition, uh, definitions not made by researchers, but made by bureaucrats or politicians or whatever you would call it, made by, uh, uh, by programs that started to granting money for smart grid. And in order to know what they were giving the money for, they had to define it. So you can find definitions here from the Department of Energy in Washington and from the European and, and so on. I listed up some, some of them here. And it's interesting to read them because they are not exactly the same, but there's something they do agree upon. Uh, they do not always agree on why we're doing it and why it should be smart and how it should be smart, but they all agree upon one thing, and this is they only talk about the electricity sector. None of them say anything about being smart in the heating sector or the transport sector, or they're only electric car because it's part of electricity, so it's all electricity. And then later on in... Uh, uh, in a paper here from the European, then you can suddenly read somebody talk about smart electricity grids along with, they also mention smart heating and cooling grids. So then they start talking about smart heating and cooling uh, grids. What I have done in the, uh, in the book and what we have done in our research group and printed there in the book is sort of trying to give a scientific uh, definition on all this. So first of all, we started to call not smart grid, smart grid, but smart electricity grid, just to know what we're talking about. And then we have a sort of condensed the definition that was already there. And then we have added what we then call smart thermal grids. That's both district heating and cooling because it's more or less the same thing. It's, it's water and pipes. So smart thermal uh, grids. And then we also added a definition on smart gas grids. Uh, this is where all the green gas comes in and so on and so forth. And then based on this definition, we have defined smart energy system. And we have defined it as an approach in which we combine all the other infrastructures. And you can also add liquid fuel if you like to, to mention that as, a, as an infrastructure. Um, and then uh, the whole idea from smart energy is to coordinate this and then identify the synergies and of course the purpose is then to be able to identify the least cost and the best solution on how to operate the whole system. And what we claim is if you do this approach then you actually also become uh, better in identifying what is the best solution within for example the electricity sector. 
because uh, if you only look at the electricity sector on its own, as I mentioned, you come to uh, transmission lines, electricity storage, and, and smart, uh, flexible demand. But if you include the other sectors, then you can find better and cheaper solutions. Uh, and also, as a consequence of this, in the energy system analysis model that we developed and we do, we have really emphasized to have all the different grids operated at the same time and analyzed at the same time. So the tool can do hourly modeling of all the grids, both the electricity grids, the district heating grid, the district cooling grid, also hydrogen production if you uh, wish to have that, and uh, green gas production. Um, there's something I haven't mentioned here, but I ought to mention also, and that is that we have actually also, because in some countries, district heating is not, it's more district cooling and other things, but in other countries, it's also water production, desalination, and so on. So that's actually also uh, part of it here, for, and we also done an analysis uh, on that. That is not so much an issue in Denmark, but that's definitely an issue in, in many other uh, countries. And we believe that uh, when you do this, it's very good to be able to make hourly uh, simulation of all the different sectors. As, as a small remark, I would say that, uh, that the, the model now is so complicated that I will never claim that we find an optimal solution. Maybe we find a suitable or, or a good solution, but the optimal solution is, is, is difficult to define here. Coming back to the CESA project, and, uh, and this smart energy approach, um, the interesting thing is, uh, based on this project, but also on other analyses we have made, and also on specific analyses of uh, feasibility studies on electricity storage in Denmark, that will be compressed air energy storage, uh, our finding is that uh, between now our current system and finding a roadmap until, for example, 2050, coming into 100% renewable solution. Um, there's really no points in, on this road in which electricity storage, for the sake of integrating wind turbines or PV, will ever be feasible. Uh, we can find better solution on the whole road uh, to that point by building thermal storage and gas and uh, and liquid storage. I must make one example. It's not so I uh, have any personal thing against batteries or anything like that. I love batteries on electric car for the reason that otherwise we cannot have a two on the Tesla and you have to have the batteries in order to transport the energy. And of course, if you have the batteries in order to transport the energy, of course, it's a good idea to charge it uh, when the wind is blowing and, 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 uh, and so on and so forth. But I see absolutely no reason, and I don't think it will be very feasible if we start building batteries in our houses, uh, because then we have much, much uh, better uh, solutions. And uh, as I already mentioned, the reason for this uh, is the cost. I will stop here and leave room for some questions. I, uh, there are some uh, links there. You can go and find more information. And also, I would uh, advocate, I've forgotten that link I can see here. We also made a small video called Smart Energy System. You can find it on, on YouTube, search for Smart Energy Systems, or go into my homepage or one of the research group's homepage, and then you can find it, where we, uh, we by animation, uh, tells the story I just told here and exactly how should all this gas and heat and cool and electricity move around in the system. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Henrik, for that interesting presentation and that we, as your southern neighbor, see what we expect uh, in 2030 and 50 from your country. Uh, I think I totally agree with you. I have one question. Uh, this morning we already have been discussing that grids are not so uh, loved by the people. Maybe in Denmark it's the same. Do you also take into account in your research group uh, grid restrictions in all your scenarios? Uh, yes, we do uh, grid restrictions in and out of uh, Denmark uh, in our calculations, but we, uh, we do not uh, consider in detail, grid restrictions within Denmark, not in the models I was told here, but we have had uh, 
investigations where we took a focus on that, but then we'll use other low flow models and, and things like that. So that's also been part of our studies actually. But, uh, but just a remark to the uh, grid uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, I think that the, uh, that the focus too much on the bottlenecks in the electricity grid itself between the countries and in and out of the countries, not that there are, there are problems that should be solved, but I think we focus too much on that and focus too little on the bottlenecks we have between the electricity sector and the heating sector and between the electricity sector and the transport sector. I think those bottlenecks are more urgent to do something about. Thank you. There's the first question from Yirshi in the audience. One uh, uh, question, uh, how you feel about hydrogen in the relation of the smart grids? I would expect Krzysztof to ask it, but uh, <laughs> if not him, it should be me. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, and you say hydrogen, you're not hydropower. Hydrogen, hydrogen. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel very good about hydrogen. I really love it. <laughs> Uh, I feel that the hydrogen, uh, I do not really believe the hydrogen society or the hydrogen highways or things like that. I think uh, hydrogen is one of the energy carriers and we need it to link between wind power and gas liquid fuel. So we need it to pr produce some hydrogen on electrolyzers, but then I think we should not let it be hydrogen for very long. Maybe we should have some small stories in order to make production and, and investments and so on. But I think very soon we should add that hydrogen to some uh, thermal gas, uh, syn gas or whatever, it's different words for that, uh, or biogas, where we have a lot of carbon and then we can have uh, more methane out of it by the end. And uh, so I don't think, and the reason for this is that the hydrogen is difficult to handle and difficult to store. And if we can turn this in as soon as possible to some methane or some methanol, then it's much easier to store. Thank you. Absolutely agreed. <laughs> um, this is Bilal Kulkus from Bashkent University. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And I fully agree, to say the least, uh, that we should pay equal attention to heat and cold in smart grids or whatever you name it in district uh, systems. I have a small question, if you don't mind. This is, you kindly mentioned that electric vehicles are the best choice. Do you mean by vehicles, individual cars with uh, onboard batteries as today or electric driven mass transit systems? Because this makes a big difference according to my study. Okay, uh, then I, uh, I don't think I'll try answering that. I'll try listen to you what you say. From my viewpoint, from the system point here, it is that the electric transportation, let me call it that, uh, is the best for the system. This is the way we can make it all function with the least amount of wind turbines and biomass and so on. Uh, if uh, that electric uh, in the car should be converted one way or another, I'm, I'm open to listen to what you think is best. Uh, let me leave it later on, discussion not to take your time, but I will be more than happy to discuss that uh, issue later on with you. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to, thanks. There are many more questions, so this one, then here, there in the blue shirt, and then in the completely back. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Blessing Mafmishavi from Anglia Ruski University. My area of research is on building energy efficiency. Yeah, you talk about um, uh, storage, electricity, I mean, energy storage. And I happen in my area of research, I have to find out that um, inverter technology is a good storage for electricity in other parts of the world, like developing countries like Africa, African countries. In fact, in my, in my research, I find out that most, bu most uh, building owners, even in offices, they have they've started adopting inverter technology especially in West African zone because of power outage. I, I, how do you find, uh, because inverter use battery 
a storage form of energy. And you are saying that uh, battery is not too good for wind storage and the rest. And in that part of the world, it's increasing and it's very, very useful. I find it very useful. It's handy and uh, it's noiseless apart from other um, environmental hazards that it might, other uh, means of uh, energy has. What is your take on this? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not sure I quite understood, but I'll, I'll try. Then you must correct me. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about electricity storage and so on yeah. is for the purpose of integrating wind or PV and so on yeah. in the perspective of reaching a 100% renewable energy system. Yeah. Uh, and there I have the conclusion as I just uh, mentioned here. But it's not, so, uh, it's not such as I have anything against batteries or anything like that. And of course, there can be in different locations on grid, off grid, or different ways of operating grid or saving peaks and so on, yeah. where you can use batteries Battery, or yeah. other solutions, no matter if you have wind or not. Oh, okay. uh, but I think that's, that's another discussion, yeah. if, if, uh, if that will be an answer to you. Oh, it's okay. I think I accept the explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Go Thank to you. Ron. Thank you, too. I'm Peter Verbano from University of Pannonia as well. Uh, we've had an, an interesting project uh, where one of our partners suggests that so-called low-temperature district heating is a good option. Uh, he meant uh, using uh, sewage as a heat source for a heat pump. Uh, what do you think about this concept? First of all, I'm very much in favor on low, on low temperature district heating. And uh, I think it goes very well with energy efficiency in the house. So you insulate the houses and then you can do with the lower temperatures, you can low, low temperature district heating, decrease the gray grids and so on. And then uh, to your question, then also in the production, we can do much more efficient. And of course, a heat pump is much more efficient if you have lower temperature compared to if you do not. So I'm very much in favor of, of, uh, of heat pumps, and I'm very much in favor of those heat pumps that sort of use consumer electricity because then we can make this, uh, this uh, power to heat uh, uh, thing about it. But it's not only the heat pumps that becomes better. Uh, we also investigate very much in Denmark in the research project. We have how to make use of all kinds of waste heats. Uh, where I come from, we have a big cement manufacturing, and if we can lower the temperature, then we can utilize even more waste heat from that. Uh, you can also do it from waste incineration of CHP, then you can utilize more. You can also do it from even small supermarkets uh, where you have cooling equipment and, and things like that, then you can start using it. So low temperature, yes, the, the lower the better. Of course, there is a, a limit to the hot water, but uh, uh, that's definitely how we look at the fourth generation district heating. Tomasz Katrasznik, University from Ljubljana. So thank you very much for interesting presentation. I would like to ask you to comment a bit more. How do you see to integrate the aircraft sector? Somehow they have a, in your this uh, 100 renewable um, concept. Um, so they have a clear demand for drop-in fuels, which by itself should not be a problem. They have much more requirements on fuel characteristics, let's say, including a minimum aromatic content to assure a ceiling capabilities. So how would you comment a bit, please, on this? Well, well, what we concentrate on in the analysis we have done here, and even from the very beginning there in 2006 and so on, is sort of to, to make the whole system fit so we have kilowatt hours enough or megajoules enough uh, in some kind of liquid fuel that could then and uh, be some kind be, be uh, used in an aircraft. When, when we started doing this and presented it the first time, I always said, yes, we have the kilowatt hours and the megajoules, but we have not persuaded any pilot to lift on it yet. Uh, and that is exactly your question. What, what should we end up having? But if you just take a look, and that's already been going on for, for several years, there are actually uh, green uh, that is now being added to the, to the jet fuel uh, concept so you can do this. Um, there's even been uh, aircraft that you could call electric uh, aircraft, uh, not really because they make an onboard reforming. We have uh, some of my colleagues in, 
in Aalborg University do uh, PEM, uh, fuel cells, high temperatures, so they have been involved uh, in that. So that's actually, what I'm trying to say, that's actually going a lot on that we couldn't even imagine for, for, for 10 years uh, ago in, in this uh, field here. Uh, I keep an open mind uh, on exactly what kind of liquid fuel we should convert. Uh, we always include that no matter what we do, there will be some losses. Uh, so we include that in our uh, uh, calculation. But I think uh, this is exciting, ex exactly what this will end up. If we should produce exactly what we use now in the airplanes, or we could also do with uh, slightly different things. Uh, thank you, Professor Lund, for the uh, very interesting uh, presentation. My name is Nicolas Schweiger, over here. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, Graz University of Technology. Uh, I was wondering uh, what you have uh, been talking about, the hydrogenation pathway uh, for your fuels, as you said. Yeah. Do you mean in that case uh, hydrogen storage on aromatic compounds like uh, naphthalene or tetraline? Or do you mean uh, full hydrogenation or more or less hydrodeoxygenation of bio-based liquids? And did you calculate all losses to, which you have uh, during hydrogenation or hydrodeoxygenation, which also, which also forms a lot of water in these processes? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I really love that question. You said a lot of words I don't even uh, sure understood. Um, so you are deep, <laughs> you're going very deep into. I uh, uh, cannot answer exactly that. Uh, of course, we include all the losses and so on when, when we calculate. But in general, we keep an open mind for that. But I know one of my colleagues will make a, a, a more thorough presentation of uh, uh, what she called electric fuel, electrofuels uh, in this, and also there will be a panel debate uh, tomorrow evening about it, and they know much more about it than I do. Thank you. Hello, Professor. I'm here on your left side. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Mehran from Iran, and I was graduated from Telemark University of College uh, in Norway. I just wanted to ask you a question about your book. Have you mentioned anything about phase change materials in your book in order to heating storage uh, or not? Because uh, we were doing a big project in Norway about uh, how to use PCM in order to heat storage for the cold uh, period of the year. I wanted to ask you, can I find any information about these materials in your book or not? Uh, try, try to repeat again, I didn't get the... Uh, phase change materials, PCM. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, no uh, it's not going into that kind of details on the, uh, on the storage technology itself. This is much more a book about how the system is integrated, no matter if the battery or the, or the storage is uh, one technology or another. So, uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not a technology uh, book in that sense that it goes into details with how, uh, how storage is uh, constructed. It's much more the prices and, and, uh, and how to use them in the system. Thank you very much. And a very last, very short question in the back side. Hello, my name is Gaurav Das. I'm from Finland, Northern Europe. Uh, I would uh, like to know that in terms of energy storage devices, we know that there are a lot of things going on in energy yep. storage devices. Yep. But according to you, where do you see this energy storage device market going in the future? And where? And in what kind of device would you actually put your bets on in, for the next economic boom, I would say? Yep. Uh, I know there's a lot of things going on there, and I think we should keep going, and we should develop all the uh, storage as good as we can. And I think that all the storage, no matter if it's within thermal or electricity, will, will be better. But what I don't believe is that this order of magnitude of price between electricity and thermal and so on, as I showed, I don't think that will disappear. And I don't think that the uh, price difference between putting storage into each individual house compared to doing it together will disappear. I think there will still be a very huge uh, difference uh, there. There may be some electricity storage that will be cheaper, but the thermal storage will also be cheaper. So uh, I think that the the point made here is something I consider rather solid. But there are uh, ongoing work and keep going because uh, the, the, we need the storage uh, in various uh, places in the system and, and the cheaper the better and the, the more efficient the better of course. So your conclusion is at the moment you cannot exactly put your bets on a specific storage type but rather than you are open to other options, am I correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. Uh, if you look into uh, different 
technologies within uh, electricity storage, for example, then I wouldn't put my bet. But if you ask me if I put my bet on a thermal storage compared to an electricity storage, then I would put my bet on the thermal storage any day. Okay. Thank you. I receive high pressure from the organizers to stop and finish here the session. Um, before you go to the coffee break, and please don't forget the poster session that is just uh, next behind us. Let's think, thank again uh, Henrik for his presentation. Thank you very much.